Well, welcome everyone. Thanks so much for coming today. We're in for a real treat. Uh, Professor Steve Sims is here to talk to us about, and the topic today is the value of a sensitive development in Lake Forest. And this is an altogether important topic right now. As we all know, that the, uh, the ma master plan for the Central Business District was just passed. And based on the community input, there's strong emphasis on preservation in that plan. Um, but in the plan, it's intentionally left open how exactly do we ensure that preservation occurs? What are the steps to do so? And thankfully, we have someone today who can provide an answer and some guidance to us on that very important topic. Um, Professor Sems is uh, an internationally respected scholar on the subjects of classical architecture, historic preservation, sensitive development, durable building, and urban design. He is currently the Professor of Architecture and Founding Director of the Michael Christopher Duda Center for Preservation, Resilience, and Sustainability at the University of Notre Dame. Uh, he was Academic Director of Notre Dame Rome Studies Program 2008 to 2011 and currently splits his teaching between uh, Rome and the main campus in South Bend. Uh, he has degrees from the University of Virginia and Columbia University and is the author of The Future of the Past, a, cons a Conservation Ethic for Architecture, Urbanism, and Historic Preservation, and The Architecture of the Classical Interior. His next book, New Building and Old City, Selected Writings of Gustavo Giovannoni, all right, uh, on architectural and urban conservation, co-edited with Jeff Cody and Francis Cervano, Cervano, Cervavo, is due to be published early next year by Getty Publications. And I can tell you, uh, the professor himself translated Italian from Gustavo's writings to English himself. So that's all part of the book. Uh, the, his, he has many articles appeared in the New Criterion, National Trust Forum Journal, Change Over Time, Public Discord, Common Edge, The Classicist, Traditional Buildings, and Palladio. He's a member of the US ICOMOS, the Society of the Architectural Historians, and the National Trust for Historic Preservation Leadership Forum, and is on the editorial committees of Change Over Time, Opus, and Palladio. Prior to joining the Notre Dame faculty in 2005, he practiced architecture for three decades in Washington, D.C., San Francisco, and New York. So he's an overachiever, <laughs> plainly. Um, you're probably asking yourself the question which I ask myself, how did we get someone to come from sunny Rome all the way to the rainy Midwest to give a presentation on preservation? And the answer is partly because Susie and Tom Reykjavik here and Susie Athenson were instrumental in getting uh, Steve here. But also in talking to Steve, it became very clear to me that he's passionate about conservation and historical conservation. Most of his time lately has been dedicated to, uh, the last several years has been on promoting harmonious new development in historic settings, allowing for change and growth without sacrificing historic character, which is apropos of our topic and our needs today. And I'll also say there's one other qualification he has that I didn't list in, this, in the, in the uh, bio here. And that is he shares something we all share in this room. He loves not only, he loves not only Rome, but he loves Lake Forest. <laughs> so with that, we thank you so much for coming and a warm welcome, please. Thank you very much, Brian. Thank you all for coming out today. I know it's a little bit of damp out there, but I appreciate uh, seeing such a nice uh, audience. It's really great. And I do want to start by thanking Brian Norton, Susan Athenson, Marcy Kerr, and Tom Rykovich for putting this event together. And I had a fantastic day yesterday touring the town with an expert, uh, Tom Rykovich. And uh, although it wasn't my first visit to Lake Forest, it was certainly the most in-depth visit that I've had so far. And um, I hope this afternoon that I can share some things with you that will uh, be of, um, of some help. Uh, because uh, I just, my first message to you is you're not alone. Uh, the, the, all the things you're dealing with are the things that, that uh, people around the world are dealing with. And so what I want to do today is maybe give you a sense of the international context in which the kinds of local debates that you have here uh, can, be, can be seen. Lake Forest is among a small number of towns in the United States gifted with a distinctive local identity, history, and character expressed through its architecture and urban form. My boss, Dean Stephanos Polizoides, was here last year and uh, pointed out that Lake Forest was among the top 5% of towns in the country, and I would agree with that assessment. Indeed, it has a national and international reputation for this distinction and constitutes a heritage that deserves attentive protection and ongoing conservation. Like many other such environments, and immediately 
come to mind uh, places like Nantucket, Massachusetts, Santa Barbara, California, and Beaufort, South Carolina as familiar examples. Lake Forest faces the challenge of protecting that character and history while also remaining economically and culturally vibrant and open to new development that does not compromise that heritage. Based on what I've seen, you're already on the way to accomplishing this as you participate in the decisions about the future development of, uh, of the town, especially in the Central Business District. Today, I think it might be useful to place the challenges you face here in Lake Forest in a larger context of her heritage conservation thinking and experience nationally and internationally. And uh, again, just to let you know that you're not alone. This is a problem that exists uh, everywhere where people actually want to live, <laughs> right? Just to not be too complicated about it. The fundamental issue throughout the history of historic preservation has been the relationship between the past and the present. The continuities as well as the discontinuities that connect the building stock and urban places we've inherited and those we are making today. While no one really wants to live in an unchanging movie set of the 1920s, although that wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, <laughs> I don't think very many of us would want to live trapped in a constantly changing present without any sense of connection or belonging, without a shared history, and without the models of buildings and towns that can show us how to live sustainably. Too many people today, unfortunately, do live in such a world. So the important challenge is to determine what aspects of what we've inherited we want to carry with us into the future and what aspects we are willing to allow to grow and change. Striking a balance, if we can, between memory and the needs of ongoing life, technologies, and economies today. Historic preservation regulation is a critical tool in that process, aiming to define the values that deserve to be preserved and setting boundaries for new conservation-informed development, especially in judging the appropriateness of proposed new construction. You already have an advanced standing in this area through the work of public and private groups and your involvement in the planning of your city places you ahead of many other communities, both in terms of advocacy and policy. In my reading, a positive feature, for example, of the 17 criteria used by the Lake Forest Historic Preservation Commission is the emphasis on visual qualities in making decisions about new development, rather than abstract concepts, though any formula attempting to describe a desired design outcome in words depends for its effectiveness on the uh, goodwill and, and commitment of those judging specific cases. We all know that. It all depends ultimately on the decision makers. In the absence of goodwill and general consensus about the value of historic preservation, language calling for compatibility can be attacked as subjective and decisions labeled arbitrary. Or perhaps worse, the usefulness of such terms can be undermined by attempts to bend the meanings of words to suit a particular project in ways unforeseen by the original drafters of an ordinance. Let me offer a few cautionary examples. This is not something that you have here, but it's something to be aware of as kind of what can go wrong, right? It's like that question, what could go wrong? <laughs> Eleven of the 17 criteria include the phrase, quote, visually compatible with the structures to which it is visually related, end quote. Placing so much weight on this phrase does raise the inherent difficulty of describing architectural forms or concepts in words and that can lead to some misreading of the regulatory language. Consider the example of the beautiful Georgian town of Bath, or Bath as they say there, in England. It has had a strong preservation community and leaders were committed to conserving the architectural and urbanistic heritage of the town. The local conservation ordinance said that any new buildings added in the historic center must reflect the historic architecture. When architect Terry Grimshaw proposed an all glass curtain wall facade for an addition to the Bath Spa complex, the city officials rejected it. But then the lawyers, sorry lawyers, if there are any lawyers in the audience, I'm going to say something about lawyers here. When the lawyers pointed out that Grimshaw's glass building did indeed reflect the classical <laughs> architecture in front of it, literally, so you see how careful you have to be in writing these kinds of standards. <laughs> 
I was there personally, it's unbelievable. <laughs> Here's another one, a little bit different. For a new glass apartment building right in the middle of the Soho cast iron historic district in New York, designed by the French architect Jean Nouvel, the preservation architects, Bayer, Blinder, and Bell, proposed a non-visual criterion for compatibility. This is something you have to watch out for. They pointed out that the original cast iron facades of the district, as you see on the left, had been an expression of the most advanced technology of their time. Nouvelle's glass and metal envelope represents the most advanced technolo technology of our time. Hence, it's compatible. It's compatible with the original historic fabric. Now, this absurd argument, I'm sorry, I'm going to express opinions occasionally. <laughs> That's all right. This absurd argument was accepted by the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission based on this purely abstract verbal or terminological cap uh, compatibility between the old and proposed new structures. Your use of the term visually compatible should at least keep the focus on the visual character of buildings and places. So you're one step ahead of the New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission. Increasingly, unfortunately, some architects and patrons have simply given up on the idea of harmonizing new and old, instead confronting the old with what years ago in a television series you may remember, the shock of the new. The same New York City Landmarks Preservation Commission approved, and the architectural community has overwhelmingly praised Studio Gang's recent cave-like addition to the late 19th century red brick Romanesque revival buildings of the Museum of Natural History on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. While some of us argue over how best to be responsive to historic context, others shrug and say, context? What context? Ultimately, there is no surefire way to put into words, I believe, what a designer must do to make a new building compatible with historic structures. For over a century, the conservation ideal has been an architectural expression that harmonizes with, but would not be mistaken for, historic design. In the end, success in that search requires general agreement about the value of historic preservation and the need for historic places to change and grow in ways that do not destroy the character-defining elements that make it worthy of preservation in the first place. It also requires some consensus in the architectural community about the expressive possibilities of contemporary design offering something more than conspicuous contrast with traditional ways of building. Today there is no such con consensus and the mainstream of contemporary architectural style is conspicuously unharmonious with historic buildings, so preservation must rely on the slender scaffolding of legislation and regulations to ensure that architects, developers, and institutional patrons do what they should have done without such prompting. I mean, that's sort of my case. I mean, if you have to write a law telling architects and owners, don't mess up your town, you know, it sort of brings into question, you know, well, why do we have to write a law telling people not to mess up their town, right? Should be, should be agreed to. It wasn't always this way. A century ago, the restorers of Colonial Williamsburg, the Boston firm of Perry Shaw and Hepburn, oversaw the restoration of dozens of buildings and un undertook the design of several new ones in an area called Merchant Square. You see the drawing there at the top. A new commercial center for Williamsburg rising just outside the restored area. This dual assignment gave the architects advantages in both directions. The restoration revealed design and construction techniques that could inform the, uh, res uh, the new buildings and the new buildings, in turn, revealed solutions or techniques that could inform the restoration process. So it was a symbiotic relationship between preservation and new design that was made possible because the architects saw themselves in continuity with those who had built the historic town hundreds of years before. And more recent additions, like you see in the lower right there, by Quinlan and Francis Terry, show that this sense of continuity can continue today. At this point, I think it would be useful to look back a little bit at some history, the history of preservation practice and debates 
that have characterized the movement since the mid-19th century and continue to occupy preservationists today. These two gentlemen, both active in their respective countries of England and France, continue to occupy, um, continue to uh, define two opposing views of how to conserve architectural heritage. John Ruskin on the left was deeply committed to, I think this is an interesting list, he was deeply committed to the Church of England, socialism, natural science, and medieval art and architecture. Now, like many incredibly gifted and intelligent people, John Ruskin's ideas don't necessarily mesh together, or at least I've found it difficult to get them together. But anyway, he, he, he was really a leader in all those fields, and it's quite interesting to read about him. He also believed that the monuments inherited from the medieval past, we're talking about England mostly, should be repaired and maintained, but not restored. Finding he found beauty in decay and opposed transformations that would restore a previous condition or add new elements. Those who see historic preservation as arresting change and keeping things as they are, are the descendants of Ruskin, as are those who insist on a clear difference between historic and contemporary building. The idea that they just, whatever is historic is historic and you don't touch it. Or if you touch it, you touch it very carefully. Like dental instruments. Right? <laughs> What's new and contemporary is over here, and they too have nothing to do with each other. That's the theory. Viollet le duc on the other hand, felt himself as the heir and continuator of the medieval building culture that Ruskin so prized. And at the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris, for example, he returned the damaged church, damaged from the French Revolution, he returned it to its medieval appearance and added the spire that all of you saw burn in the 2019 fire, but which will now be reconstructed exactly as it was. Viollet le Duc and his followers pursued restoration <coughs> and reconstruction, even when sure knowledge of the historical condition was maybe incomplete or lacking, confident in their own ability to channel, as it were, the knowledge and art of the original builders. These two schools of thought represent entirely different views of the relationship between the present and the past. Today, Ruskin's words are still used by those who approach conservation in a strictly scientific way, limiting interventions to the minimum required to maintain a site and requiring anything added to bear, as the Venice Charter will say many years later, a contemporary stamp. In other words, the new must be identifiable as new. Ville le Duc's path is still that followed by many preservationists and restorers who quietly go about the business of replacing and restoring damaged or missing elements or entire buildings, seeing the object of conservation as the original design intent, the ongoing building culture, and the practice of the traditional trades and crafts rather than simply the material artifact alone. As we will see, international discourse about what and how to preserve will continue to develop along these two parallel tracks of these two 19th century figures. One of the things that's amazed me, I'm not a professional historian, but in my study of history, one of the things that's amazed me is how things just keep being repeated, generation after generation. The same language, the same arguments that you heard in 19th century England or France, you will hear probably in your public meetings right here in Lake Forest, it's quite interesting. I have a question about John Ruskin. Yes, sir. Because we're on the topic. Um, so what happens when, so his point was that he, he embraced decay. Mm -hmm. He might have called it patina or something like exactly. that. Exactly. The stain of time, he called it. And so but what happens when a building or anything, a statue or anything, degrades to a point where it's, um, it maybe it's no longer safe? Mm -hmm. is, is the whole idea then to just destroy it so you just... Mm -hmm. I, I would recommend to you, there's a wonderful passage in his book, The Seven Lamps of Architecture. And there's the one, and I, now I can't tell exactly which of the seven he talks about restoration, but it's in there. And he actually says, if the building is crumbling, let it die a natural death, and then build a new one. Ruskin wanted the Gothic to continue in his own time. He didn't have the idea that what we build today has to be entirely different from what was built in the past. So if something from the past is no longer repairable, build something new. Now, a lot of people push back on that. You know, we wouldn't want Notre Dame to just, you know, fall to the ground, although it almost did. 
But uh, so I would just say, if I may express my own personal opinion, that it's, it's one of those stop your both right moments. Ruskin was right about some things and VLA was right about some things. And in a moment, um, I'll come to how they start to converge. These issues involve peoples and heritages all over the world, and we can trace the evolution of conservation thinking in a sequence of international charters and declarations issued by ICOMOS, that's the International Council on Monuments and Sites, which is um, a, a sort of under the protection of UNESCO and the United Nations. It's the international body that sort of governs conservation worldwide. ICOMOS, UNESCO, and other bodies from the Anth Athens Charter of 1931 to the Valletta Principles of 2011. Among the two dozen or so documents in this literature, a recurrent theme is the role of contemporary architecture in historic settings. And I'd like to give you a sampling of some of these documents, drawing out those aspects that remain current and might have direct application right here in uh, Lake Forest. The 1931 Charter of Athens was the first such international agreement, emphasized the role of context in the assessment of any historic monument, that context was understood explicitly in visual terms. And uh, if you'll allow me, I'll just uh, read aloud this, this passage here. Quote, in the construction of buildings, the character and external aspect of the cities in which they are to be erected should be respected, especially in the neighborhood of ancient monuments where the surroundings should be given special consideration. Certain groupings and certain particularly picturesque perspective treatments should be preserved." End quote. Now, in 1931, when that was written, the modern movement in architecture had barely begun to be a factor. It was just brand new at the time, maybe a decade old and hadn't yet uh, swept the field, let's say. So this charter asks for respect for the monument and its setting. Continuity, rather than contrast, was the norm. The charter seeks to harmonize past and present, always maintaining a strong relationship between a monument and its setting. Today, we call this contextualism. One of the drafters and signatories of the Athens Charter, the Italian architect that uh, Brian mentioned that I've been working on, Gustavo Giovannoni, returned to Rome after the conference and drafted the Italian Charter for Restoration, 1932. A central theme is the importance of looking beyond the individual monument to see the historic urban environment as a whole. And he calls for, quote, respect for the conditions of the setting, which should not be altered by inappropriate isolation or by additions or new buildings discordant in massing, color, or style, end quote. Preservation at the urban scale, therefore, aims to create a new ensemble in which older buildings are recontextualized. That's a, a word that I attach a lot of importance to. By the new buildings in consonant formal languages and harmonious materials. The old buildings are woven into a new urban fabric with buildings of different ages, but similar in massing, color, and style. Rome's Corso del Rinascimento, which you see there in the lower picture, was master planned by Giovannoni with new buildings by his student, Arnaldo Fuschini. It's a modern street formed by widening an older, much narrower one that was just outside the monumental Piazza Navona. Those of you who've been to Rome or have seen pictures will know Piazza Navona. Well, at the turn of the 20th century, there was an abs a, 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 a formal plan to turn Piazza Navona into a traffic artery. They were gonna have traffic going up and down, you know, around the fountains there. And Giovannoni was one of the people who led the fight against that. And so he convinced them to build a bypass. So that was the bypass that they built, that he master planned. Um, let's see, here we go. Uh, the result is a lively mix of 16th and 20th century buildings forming a continuous fabric in which it's not clear at first glance which buildings are old and which are new. The street shows us how we can alter the specific form of a historic environment without radically altering its character. Giovannoni also considered criteria for achieving harmony in individual structures. So he says, quote, for additions, the essential criterion to be followed should be that of giving them a character of naked simplicity and correspondence to the constructive scheme, and that it is admissible to continue the existing lines in similar style 
only in cases of geometric expressions without decorative individuality, end quote. What does he mean by this? Well, the example is the Arch of Titus near the Roman Forum. And you, if you look closely, you'll notice that some of it looks like really old carved marble. That's from Roman antiquity. And some of it looks like relatively modern travertine. And what that did was it took the remains of the Roman triumphal arch and recomposed it with new material so that we see it as a whole, but we also see which part is Roman antique and which part is, has been made uh, newly in order for us to see it whole, right? So there's this idea that you tell the truth about the monument while making it whole. Giovannoni's model here is Giuseppe Valadier's restoration of the Arch of Titus where the ancient design of the triumphal arch is made whole, but new elements use a slightly different material. Only the architectural lines are completed without attempting to replicate the ornamental carvings of the ancient marble. A new context is established, one intended to present the ancient monument as a whole rather than a fragment, but also as a participant in a larger ensemble of forms, not simply an isolated artifact. The original fragments of the ancient arch are thus recontextualized by the added materials, avoiding replication that would confuse us about what was ancient, but without necessary contrast between the new and the old. At the same time that the Athens and Italian charters were being written, historic districts were being created in the United States. It, this is a very interesting moment. Here you have this sort of emerging consciousness about monuments and their place in the, the city. And at the same time, here in America, we're starting to create the first historic districts. I haven't yet been able to find out if there was an actual connection between the two or whether it was just in the air. But it's interesting that this is happening at the same time. The first one in Charleston in 1931, the same year as the Athens Charter, was followed by New Orleans, Brooklyn Heights, and several others. There are now hundreds. The restoration of Williamsburg in Virginia was also getting underway, all of these representing an approach to architecture and preservation in which the past and the present were in partnership rather than opposition. Continuity of character was the aim. Now, let's just take a quick glance at that ordinance of 1931 in Charleston. It is deemed essential by the city council that the qualities relating to the history of the city and a harmonious outward appearance of structures be preserved. That such purpose is advanced through the preservation and protection of old historic or architecturally worthy structures and neighborhoods which impart a distinct aspect to the city and which serve as visible reminders of the historic and cultural heritage of the city, state, and nation. Continued construction of buildings in the historic styles and a general harmony as to style, form, color, proportion, texture, and material between buildings of historic design and those of more modern design." End quote. It's interesting that they had this all figured out in 1931. <laughs> this ordinance has succeeded in preserving Charleston as the beautiful place it remains today, even if at times, this is a little confession here, the Board of Architectural Review established by that ordinance has not always prevented incongruous new construction as required by the law. Enforcement here, again, ultimately depends on the people tasked with judging compliance. So you can have the best laws in the world, but if the people enforcing them are you know, not necessarily committed to them, then you, know, you still have problems to, to deal with. Even as these projects were moving forward, though, architectural culture was undergoing revolutionary change. The modern movement offered a radical critique of traditional architecture and urbanism, proposing a new vision that would replace, rather than incorporate, the historic city. We can see the new attitude in projects by Walter Gropius, Mies van der Rohe, Le Corbusier, and their followers from the 1920s onward, which, even if they were not built, exercised enormous influence over several generations of architects. The new idea was to create the maximum contrast between the historic and the new, reflecting a new attitude about the meaning of history and the character of the built environment. In Le Corbusier's model, here for the so-called Plan Voisin in Paris, 1925, the Cathedral of Notre Dame and the Louvre, if you look for them, you can see them, are visible as remnants of historic Paris, the bulk of which has been swept away in favor of a brave new world of skyscrapers set in parks. 
Visions like these have become our reality today in many places. The 1933 Siam Charter, drafted by Le Corbusier, Siam was the uh, French initials for the Congress of, of uh, International Modern Architecture. 1933, they issued their statement, quote, the whole of the past is not, by definition, entitled to last forever. It is advisable to choose wisely that which must be respected. In the case where one is confronted with structures repeated in numerous examples, some will be preserved as documents and the others will be demolished. I call this the Noah's Ark theory of preservation, where you, you preserve examples as documents and then the rest has to go. The practice of using styles of the past on aesthetic pretexts for new structures erected in historic areas has harmful consequences. Neither the continuation of such practices nor the introduction of such initiatives will be tolerated in any form." End quote. Thank you, Uncle Joe Stalin, for that <laughs> admirable statement of intent. This is clearly not just a friendly suggestion about architectural taste, rather a rather dictatorial threat to historic cities that would lead, among other things, to the destruction of the urban renewal programs in the United States after the Second World War. In many respects, the historic preservation movement has been an ongoing attempt to mitigate and contain the transformations driven by the spread of modern movement ideas about buildings and cities. But the preservation movement itself was not unaffected by the new ideas. In 1938, a young architectural historian at the Italian Ministry of Public Instruction named Giulio Carlo Argan was asked to update Gustavo Giovannoni's 1932 code for uh, restoration in Italy uh, to conform to the views of the Minister of Public Instruction, a man named Giuseppe Bottai, who was a thoroughly awful person, <laughs> but also was one of the principal advocates for modern movement architecture in the fascist government. The new policy covered both new and restoration work throughout Italy, and the instruction declared, quote, this is really a great quote, for obvious reasons of historical dignity and for the necessary clarity in current artistic consciousness, the construction of buildings in historic styles is absolutely to be avoided, since these represent a double falsification with respect to both the ancient and the recent history of art." End quote. The term falsification of history reflects the view that artworks are important to us principally as historic documents. And as such, their authenticity rests in a conformance between the style of the work and the time when it was made and the prevailing style at that time. So if the leading fashion in 1930s Italy was the international style represented by the rationalist designers like Giuseppe Torragni, shown in the upper photo, um, a work that resembled some earlier style would be considered inauthentic. Further, Argon and Bottaille believed that only a clear difference between modern art and all previous art could preserve the authenticity of uh, art movements and uh, contemporary expression. Thus, there can be no harmonization between new and old, only clear juxtaposition. The same attitude is visible in the Museum of the Arapaches in Rome by Richard Meyer in the lower photo, where the juxtaposition of the new building and the older ones adjacent uh, are two, represent two irreconcilable kinds of architecture. The consequences for the heritage environment is to decontextualize the places. While this approach would seem to be contrary to the aims of historic preservation, there are many in the field, especially those trained in architecture and architectural history, who have adopted Argonne's principles as their own. So that's kind of another little thing to be aware of. In 1964, the Charter of Venice was initially conceived as a post-war updating of Giovannoni's 1932 Italian Charter, and most of its text is unexceptionable but in the final version of the language seemed to swing toward Argonne's views in a famous passage from Article 9, quote, restoration must stop at the point where conjecture begins. And in this case, moreover, any extra work which is indispensable must be distinct from the architectural composition and must bear a contemporary stamp, end quote. 
This passage has generally been interpreted as requiring a contrasting modernist style for new elements and prohibiting work considered imitative of the historic setting. Carlo Scarpa's intervention at the Castelvecchio of Verona in Italy is often seen as a model for this approach, in which surviving medieval fabric has been meticulously restored, but new elements are almost obsessively detached from the historic construction. Scarpa's designs are often viewed by architects as embodying the Venice Charter ideal, but recent scholarship suggests this conventional interpretation of the Charter is wrong. I won't get into the academic details of all of this with different scholars debating what the French terms mean, but I will just mention that there are two other articles in the same charter which are in direct contradiction with that idea that I just presented. So additions cannot be allowed except in so far as they do not detract from the interesting parts of the building, its traditional setting, the balance of its composition, and its relation with its surroundings." End quote. So it's a little hard to justify those two readings. There's no question that Scarpa's intervention altered the relations of mass and color, and vis visitors today mostly go there to see his work, not the medieval building. So uh, that's uh, another example of a kind of misreading. Now, scholars are debating this, saying, well, that's actually not what the French original text says. So I leave it to a Belgian, okay, a, a French-speaking Belgian, to uh, inform us about, well, what does the French actually say? And she says, it actually says that additional work accepted as indispensable or as for aesthetic or technical reasons is a matter of architectural design, not must be separate from the composition, but is in fact a distinction between restoration and design. Design is design, restoration is restoration. I think everyone can agree with that. But this whole bit about how you have to put something in there that is different from what is there is really not in the text according to my source. Then we come across the Atlantic to our own shores because all of that is sort of the context for the Secretary of the Interior's standards for rehabilitation. In the mid-1970s, the American Charter, if we may call it that, was drafted by staff of the National Park Service. The Secretary of the Interior's standards were originally intended to define the eligibility requirements for preservation projects receiving federal grants or tax credits. The standards were never intended to be a national preservation policy, but a de facto national policy is what they became in the absence of any other guidance. And like the Venice Charter on which they were based, the standards involve some ambiguous language. Regarding new additions to historic buildings, Standard 9 says, quote, the new work shall be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the massing, size, scale, and architectural features to protect the historic integrity of the property and its environment, end quote. Here we have a balance between two potentially conflicting <laughs> adjectives. New work must be differentiated, but also compatible. It must be large, but also small. <laughs> it must be right, but also wrong. I mean, it's hard to sort of balance these out. As it happens, officials have tended to enforce the first adjective while largely disregarding the second one. There is no question that the first is easier to comply with. Contrast with historic design is what modern architecture is all about, as I su suggested earlier. But making a new building compatible with a historic environment is not easy for a, uh, for a designer not trained to do it. And we know that very few schools of architecture today actually do train architects in traditional languages. I happen to be from one that does do that, and I think everybody knows that Notre Dame has this uh, peculiar uh, curriculum where we actually teach students about historical architecture. In the guidelines issued by the National Park Service for many years, I, I've lost count, but decades, this building shown here was illustrated, and you see the original illustration in black and white there, this building was illustrated as an example of compliance with Standard 9. It certainly is differentiated from the original stone Romanesque revival Newberry Library in Chicago, but its compatibility is based almost entirely on it being about the same height as the historic structure that it's joining. <coughs> but I have to ask the question, how can a new building be compatible with the scale and architectural features of the old one if it has no scale or architectural features? 
Um, I should also note that the standards were written, as I said, for a, with a narrow objective uh, about you know qualification for grants and so on. It was also written only for individual structures. It was never intended to be applied to districts or large uh, large numbers of buildings. But that hasn't stopped people from trying to do that, and it has created havoc in uh, historic districts around the country. People trying to apply this idea of differentiation in ways that uh, interfere with. Uh, the growth of historic districts. In numerous cases, truly compatible new designs were rejected by review boards for not being sufficiently differentiated. But if you think about it, there's a logical contradiction in requiring that anything added to a historic site be conspicuously different from what is already there. After the second or third such addition, the character of the place will be altogether transformed, its context destroyed, and our ability to understand its cultural significance denied. Yeah, the first edition, yeah, okay, make a contrast. What about second and third edition? How are you gonna keep contrasting? You're gonna end up with a zoo, an architectural zoo. Now, eventually, the National Park Service did realize the problem, and in 2014, issued a new edition of a publication, the Guideline on Additions to Historic Structures, showing for the first time that new construction in the same or similar styles as the historic building uh, was uh, also compliant with Standard 9, noting um, that it is no longer necessary to build a glass box next to the Georgian house, though many continue to insist on it as if it were one of the Ten Commandments. And even the Park Service hasn't been able to convince them otherwise. But even as the Secretary's standards were taking effect in the U.S., international charters continued to evolve. The ICOMOS Washington Charter of 1987 explicitly declares itself a supplement to the Venice Charter and tries to clarify the meaning of the earlier document. Quote, qualities to be preserved include the formal appearance, interior and exterior, of buildings as defined by scale, size, style, construction, materials, color, and decoration. When it is necessary to construct new buildings or adopt existing ones, the introduction of contemporary elements in harmony with the surroundings should not be discouraged since such features can contribute to the enrichment of an area." End quote. As in the Athens Charter of 1931, it is the harmonious visual character of the place that must be safeguarded, including, where appropriate, architectural style. The Washington Charter also ties physical conservation to economic and social development, seeing the preservation of historic towns and cities as good for growth rather than an impediment to it. Other charters continue to expand the scope of conservation to include the intangible aspects of building cultures, starting with the Bura Charter from Australia, where conservation officials had to deal with indigenous cultures that had different views about what was culturally significant and used less durable materials or gave greater importance to landscape rather than buildings. So Bura says, quote, new work such as additions may be acceptable where it respects and does not distort or obscure the cultural significance of the place or detract from its interpretation and appreciation. New work should be readily identifiable as such, but it, may, it should be sympathetic in its citing bulk, form, scale, character, color, etc similar to the existing fabric, but imitation should be avoided. So again, this sort of this balancing act. Note, though, that there is no reference to contemporary design or difference. The conservation of cultural significance is what they're mostly interested in. Since it first appeared, the Borough Charter has become a model for efforts internationally to move heritage conservation away from an excessively Eurocentric and monument-centered approach by placing emphasis on preserving and interpreting the site's significance and its ongoing building culture rather than curating it like a collection of museum objects. In a related spirit, several of the charters emphasize the recovery and conservation of traditional materials and techniques. Most historical styles are, in some way, the products of particular building processes and materials. So continuity of character is more likely to be conserved by maintaining these traditional methods and materials rather than uh, specifying or prohibiting different architectural styles. The ongoing craft traditions are or ought to be objects of conservation in their own right. This is what we nowadays refer to as intangible heritage. 
it's the heritage not of brick and mortar, but of like the knowledge of how to make bricks and mortar and how to put them together. So the know-how is also part of uh, what we want to conserve. In 2011, the Valletta principles of Icomos offered the most explicit rejection of the misinterpretation of the Venice Charter. The text takes a holistic approach to protecting urban character, and it's something I think is terribly helpful. Quote, regardless of style and expression, all new architecture should avoid the negative effects of drastic or excessive contrast or fragmentation and interruptions in the continuity of the urban fabric and space. Priority must be given to a continuity of composition that does not adversely affect the existing architecture, but at the same time allows a discerning creativity that embraces the spirit of the place." End quote. Actually, the whole document is worth reading. If you, if you go to the ICOMOS website, you can download it for free, and you'll read it in two columns, English and French, side by side, so you can check. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a very useful document. It's relatively recent. It's almost completely not known by people, certainly in the US. I showed this to the president of the National Trust for Historic Preservation a few years ago, and she'd never heard of it. But I think it would be worthwhile uh, for all of us to, uh, uh, to read and study this one. The principles, the Valletta principles, see historic architecture and new design as partners. Asking designers to embrace the spirit of the place does not necessarily diminish the creativity of the designers, and conservation interest is not harmed by admitting growth and change that respects historic character. This language could be helpful to guide judgments in individual cases. All these texts are interesting and give us helpful language, but how do we transfer these abstract ideas into concrete proposals? As I mentioned, because most architects practicing today have not been trained in traditional architecture, we have to study the buildings and towns that we wish to preserve and derive from them the DNA that allows us to build new things in harmony with them. As the French writer Françoise Chouet wrote, we restore in order to recapture our capacity to build. I love that. We restore in order to learn how to build. An effective tool is the form-based code that takes the historic building practices of a place and calls for their continuation in new development. One begins by identifying the character-defining elements that make the historic setting valuable. This is what the Nantucket Historical Commission did when it created design principles based on local building types. Here we have two pages from their book devoted to the massing, volumes, and roof lines that define the shapes of buildings typical in that place. Getting that right is the first step, followed by getting good window and door openings and elements like porches and chimneys. The architectural vernacular of a place can be learned, and new buildings designed in kind. Yes, it takes time and expertise to develop these kinds of guidelines, but it can be done. And it also helps if there's an ongoing construction tradition and building trades that still know how to build in traditional ways. When considering specific detail, we should be able, or specific details of, of local construction, we should be able to say, we build that way here because. You know, there should be a kind of a local reason, like, this is how we build in Lake Forest. It's going to be different from Nantucket. Yes, sir. Professor Summers, could you verbally walk us around this? My eyes are not as good as they once were. Oh, okay, yes. And, and I highly recommend if you, and, and it may be that one of the libraries in town might have this book. It's from the 1990s, but it's still in use. It's called Building with Nantucket in Mind. And so what you see on these two pages, for example, is a whole lesson in how uh, traditional Nantucket buildings were um, designed three-dimensionally as a set of volumes, let's say boxes. The boxes didn't go together just any old way. They went together in certain ways that were predictable, that were based on logic and construction and function and every other sort of reason, right? And once you had your boxes, obviously you had to put gable roofs on them. Well, gable roofs don't go together easily if you have boxes that don't kind of allow that. So you have to actually, I tell my students, you have to design for the building from the top down. You don't design the building and then figure out how to put a roof on it. That's a recipe for disaster and leaks. But, um, but what this is doing is showing, for example, how a main volume then has things added to it. 
which is a different way of doing it than, say, taking a big volume and then like cutting pieces and taking them away. So that's a different process. And on the right-hand page, some um, uh, discussion of how roofs and openings and how, why do windows align vertically and why are there so many bays in a facade? So it's, as I said, it's trying to get at the DNA of how you build buildings in, the, in Nantucket. And obviously Nantucket isn't Lake Forest, but the same procedure could be used here to determine, well, how did uh, Howard Van Doren Shaw turn a corner when he had to, you know? Because turning corners are, uh, for an architect is actually, uh, it's a good thing to check out the corners. That's where we, we either rise or fall. Yes, sir? Is there an application of um, form-based code transitioning from housing stock to business stock? Yes. Rather similarly, I, I don't have an example here today to show you, but um, that's what form-based codes try to do. They start with a kind of analysis of, well, well, how is the town made? What are the things in the town that determine its character? And then how can those things be used in new, in new ways? And so it's a two-part thing. It's a first of it's a study of the precedent of the historic place and its buildings and so on. And secondly, how to apply that uh, to new buildings. And, and there are dozens of people around the country now who do that for a living and are very good at it. Uh, that's not my personal field, but uh, you know, there, are, there are plenty of folks. Because it's, uh, there's a bunch of people around the country that do that, um, it's a unique um, aspect of using that, that uh, discipline yes. going from houses yes. to businesses, business stock. But it's the, same I, it's, the, it's the same idea, because what you're doing is you're regulating the volumes. You're essentially regulating volumes. You're saying, like this, you know, the house can be so big and it can be made of these kinds of volumes and they can be joined together in this way and you turn a corner in this way and you, uh, you put the parking behind in this way. And, and that's how it goes. It goes from understanding what worked in the past and how to do that again and how to codify that so that that goes forward. Okay? Thank you. Sure. Another example, a little bit more generalized, is the guidance on compatible infill by Restore Oregon, the statewide preservation organization there. These guidelines are applicable anywhere and provide an essential companion to the Secretary's standards, clarifying intent and suggesting applications. It's interesting to read these alongside the Secretary's standards because their whole point is to kind of add a little bit more clarity to them. So, it's divided into several headings, which are worth pointing out. Um, I really like these headings. The district is the resource, not the individual building. That's very important, because when you're dealing with a place, you're not dealing with w one house on a road somewhere out in the middle of the country. You're dealing with an entire town. And if that town is defined as a district, then it's the district itself is the resource, not the individual building. New construction will reinforce the historic significance of the district. Okay, reinforce, not reflect. Uh, that's, a good, that's a good word choice. Uh, new construction will complement and support the district. Infill will be compatible, yet distinct. Again, search for that balance between directly replicating what was there and doing something that's alien and, and doesn't seem to fit. Um, the Oregon guidelines show us how one can proactively encourage quality new construction in historic settings, and it does include both residential and commercial construction because it's infill of any kind in uh, any kind of historic district. The most recent of all that I'll talk about today is the text of Pope Francis's encyclical letter Laudato Si, which is an extraordinary document bringing together matters of religious faith and the ethical treatment of what he calls our common home. The Pope defends the need to protect natural ecosystems and species, but also the human-built heritage. Perhaps the most striking aspect is the great attention he directs toward the role of culture in not only shaping the way we build and interact with the natural world, but also directing our responses to the crises we face today, especially climate change. An update on this important text is expected soon that will further, I hope, underscore our ethical commitment to the stewardship of a built world that is beautiful, sustainable, and just. The bulk of all this guidance seeks to encourage just what the Lake Forest preservation advocates and officials have been trying to do, 
manage change in a character-conserving but economically and socially rewarding way. In addition to the issue of visual compatibility, you might also think about the meaning of that hard-to-define term, appropriateness, since one of the things that your commission does, part of its job, is to issue something called a certificate of appropriateness. I go all over the country, and wherever I speak, I ask people, what do you think the word appropriateness means? And it's a very hard, it's sort of one of those things like, I know it when I see it, right? <laughs> Well, I do want to suggest a definition that I've been using for a little while. I suggest that the appropriate, when applied to judging new design and historic settings, entails the fitting and the exemplary. Fitting because, simply, the new fits. It's that visual compatibility again. Taking its place in the existing setting with tact and respect. But exemplary because everything we add to a historic setting should set an example for those who would come after us, the second and third edition, as I mentioned. We should only build what we would like to see more of. I think that's a very good principle. Don't build anything that you won't want to see repeated again. Because you know what? In the architectural culture today, if some architect, some stylish architect, makes a building and everybody goes, wow! What happens? All the second and third rate architects make buildings look just like that, right? So architects who want to be taste makers and, and you know, design leaders have to think, you know, I shouldn't do anything that I'll regret seeing the copies of, <laughs> right? Because, you know, the architect needs to take responsibility for what his, his or her disciples do with what he does or she does. We should only build what we would like to see more of. This gives a forward-looking aspect to preservation regulation. It's not only about preserving the past, but also shaping the future of the place. Here in Lake Forest, you have an inheritance that must be treasured, but you also have the tools you need to ensure its future. Moreover, you have the best wishes of people across the nation and around the world, to which I can only add my own. And I would just close by saying that any of you are or know of young architects who would like to pursue historic preservation in a graduate study at Notre Dame, please tell them to get in touch with us. We would love to hear from them. Thank you very much. Yes, as a man, and uh, if somebody else has a question, I'd be happy to. Yes, sir. Yeah. How do you think about the landscape when assessing appropriateness of development? That's a great subject for a whole other talk. But to put it in a nutshell, I would say that landscape is, if we're looking at the environment holistically, obviously landscape, whether we mean completely undisturbed nature from one end of the spectrum to something where we have very carefully, you know, like planted a garden or designed something or the the, I don't know, the tulips and the median strip, whatever, it's all landscape. It has to do with the, uh, the interweaving of what we make and what nature provides, right? So one of the things that's interesting is that people have become more holistic and more comprehensive in talking about conservation. So it's no longer about Mount Vernon as an individual house where George Washington lived, although that's important. That's sort of not the end of it. We're now talking about places like Lake Forest that involve buildings, streets, squares, blocks, trees, grass, flowers, uh, ravines were mentioned, uh, water runoff and retention and natural water courses. Um, all of that goes into what now the uh, United Nations uh, deliberations and, and declarations refer to as urban landscape. So that concept is sort of what people are now dealing with is the notion of urban landscape combining all of those elements. So they all have to be part of a conservation plan. I hope that answers your question. Yes, sir. So in addition to all that you've mentioned, we now have sidewalks that are filled with scooters, mm. bikes, mm. people that want to walk slowly, people <laughs> that want to walk quickly, Runners. Uh, and are uh, sidewalks wide enough, et cetera, et cetera. So what thoughts do you think we should bring to the table about those issues? At a certain point, I guess, in everyone's life, you get to the point where things that you thought were really cool 
can also become really irritating. Um, you know, when, when bicycle sharing and scooter sharing first appeared and car sharing, we have in Rome, we have car sharing, which is a great thing, we use it. But you can't just leave your car in the middle of someone's front lawn and, you know, <laughs> like you can a scooter. Well, you're not supposed to do that either, but from a like sustainability environmentalist point of view, wonderful. We have these scooters and these bicycles, we get people away from their cars. But then we create another problem, and the other problem is, you know, people leave them in the most inconvenient places, right? I mean, uh, you, know, uh, you will try to, you know, leave your apartment building one morning and there are six scooters blocking the path so you can't get out of your building. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, the company's just, either the company or the city has to, like, charge $500 every time somebody leaves a scooter, you know, where it's not supposed to be. It's obviously, it's not an architectural problem, uh, some cities have um, uh, dealt with this by simply banning them. But I think that's also the wrong solution. I think it's about, about learning how to manage them and creating the economic incentives for people to do what they should do. It's sort of, again, when you have to write a law to get people to do what they should have done anyway, it sort of means that, you know, it's, it's discouraging, that you just have to do it, right? I hope that's an answer to your question. I, I think they're important and, and sidewalks are important. The fact that different kinds of users are using the same sidewalk. It's like um, bicycle paths, bicycle paths. Runners want to run on bicycle paths. People want to walk on them. Uh, but there are more and more accidents, people being injured, you know, um, not to mention bicyclists being injured by cars and so on. That's really not something I really know how to solve, but I think that, um, Again, it's probably not so much going to be a physical solution. It's going to be some kind of a management solution, I think. So yes? Should the width of site box be rethought? We have more outdoor eating. Yes. We have more places where people walk only. So should we be thinking of those terms as we architecturally look at space? The, yeah, the, the follow-up question, how should we design sidewalks? considering all the different uses and demands placed on them. Uh, you're absolutely right. Urban designers, especially since COVID, when all the restaurants sort of moved out into sidewalk cafes, and, you know, Americans love going to France and Italy and dining in outdoor cafes, and we think how wonderful that is, but then we come home, we don't do it here, and then a, a virus makes us do it, and so now everybody's kind of happily eating outdoors, but then there's, an, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a sort of another bug which has to do with how do you design for uh, having sidewalk cafes on sidewalks that weren't designed to have sidewalk cafes. Well, one thing you can do is you can design for sidewalk cafes by actually uh, closing some streets and turning streets into piazze. Because in Italy, we eat outdoors all the time, even with cars passing. I once had dinner at a table in a narrow little street in Rome, and a car was like this far away from the edge of my table, and I had to sort of hang on to my wine glass <laughs> as this, you know, fiat went by the table. It's called shared space. We have to learn how to share space. And one of the things that Americans haven't had to do, but now probably do, is learn how you could have a paved area that is a parking lot and a street and a runner's path and a bicycle path and a, you know, and a sidewalk cafe. It's all of those things at the same time. And this is something that isn't part of American culture, but maybe we need to learn, because that's what you find in other places. Yes, sir? Uh, Professor Sims, thank you very did much. I, did I mention regulation? <laughs> you did, you did, uh, coming back to it. Uh, in your book, yes. The Future of the Past, the very beginning, actually the preamble to chapter one, you have a quote from an attorney. Yes. Uh, See, I like attorneys <laughs> it's, it's when they're on my side. Decision on Penn Central. Yes. Uh, and he talks about the importance of, if you have the you know, architectural significance, the cultural significance, the historic significance, that's a quality of life issue. Right. And I come to that point, you know, here in Lake Forest, do you feel it's a quality of life issue? Oh, uh, yes, the question had to do with um, the um, passage from a, a legal opinion that uh, appears at the beginning of uh, The Future of the Past, which talks about the legal basis for defending preservation and conservation. And um, uh, is this not, in fact, a, a quality of life issue, uh, whether we're talking about it in general or here specifically in Lake Forest? I would say it is. 
um, I kind of would go along with the Pope in saying that our care for our home, our larger home, not just our, you know, where our, we and our family lives, but the home that we share with our uh, fellow citizens or fellow human beings, uh, thinking about how we really want to promote a quality of life for everyone. I mean, one of the things that's happened in the last decades is the um, awareness of the challenges for historic towns, I'm sure you have it here too, of gentrification and mass tourism. Especially in places like where I live in Rome, both of those are serious problems. There are neighbor whole neighborhoods of Rome where you never hear Italian in the street because the entire neighborhood has been occupied by Swedes and Dutch and American and French and so on. It's charming. I mean, it's still nice. You know, they're Europeans. They're cool. But you know, the the idea that um, uh, the community that made that place at some point is is uh, displaced. Uh, happens here in the U.S. too, of course, and quite often it's people who are in the least, who are the least capable of defending themselves, who are being, you know, asked to leave their homes, and that's something that many of us are very uh, concerned about. And mass tourism has negative effects of, uh, at, at times, seeming to overrun the physical space. Where there are days in Venice where you really cannot go anywhere because there are just so many people clogging the bridges and streets that you can't move anymore effectively. Well, let me just mention one possible way of dealing with that. And this gets back to your idea of quality of life. Here's a hypothetical. If everybody lived in a beautiful place, they wouldn't need to go to Venice. <laughs> Why don't we build places where people want to live so they don't feel like they have to go somewhere else to see what they should have? Yes, Pam. Yes. We are in Lake Forest, and we only have one lake climate, maybe quarter of the year. And so, you know, when we go to some of the more urban areas that have a lot of this, in the winter time, you see a lot of plastic umbrella kind of thing. Yeah. You can't see the beautiful structure behind it. And right. So how do we weigh that versus the good three months of the year and keep it viable for whoever would be occupying? Yes, the question is, uh, given the climate of um, the Chicago metro region and the Great Lakes and so on, how do we deal with outdoor dining and creating more viable outdoor space? I have two thoughts about that. This is not something I personally have thought about very much, but I'll give you two off the top of my head ideas. One is, um, before uh, automobiles, people did in fact live outdoors a lot more than they do today. They did walk a lot of places. Yeah, they had to button up their overcoat, but you know, um, people were much more outside than they are nowadays, even if the climate is, is challenging at times. A second thought is go to Stockholm, you know, go to Helsinki, go to St. Petersburg. Uh, these places are even colder than uh, Lake Forest. Um, and yet they also have outdoor life going on. I think the colder the place is in the winter, the more the people appreciate the summer, right? So when, even if the summer is only like three weeks long, you know, <laughs> they make those three weeks count. And uh, I, I don't know if that's an answer to your question, but I think there is a, a specific design problem. And the specific design problem is how do we encourage more outdoor use and more social life uh, in our cities, regardless of the climate. Obviously, it's going to be different in Miami than it is in Chicago, but they're diff it's different everywhere, right? So uh, we're going to keep working on that. So thank you for raising the issue. Yes, sir? Um, it's my understanding that you've had a, a nice tour around Lake Forest. I did, yes. And what strikes you about the Central Business District? What, is the, what are some of the first adjectives, the first observations that you have about it? What, makes it good and what makes it bad? I can't think of anything that makes it bad. Um, truly, I mean, yes, you can clap if you want. The question was, uh, in my tour of the Central Business District of Lake Forest, uh, what were my impressions? Uh, what made it good or bad or what stuck with me? Um, I would say on the positive side, uh, I was very impressed by the intimate scale, the fact that it's a two or three story village, essentially, 
um, where things like the clock tower or the uh, sundial tower stand out or the village uh, tower stand out because everything else is two or three stories. So you can have a kind of landmark that can be seen from a distance without you know, having to resort to you know, very tall buildings. Um, things like the widths of sidewalks, the widths of planting beds, the street trees, uh, the width of the street, the traffic lanes, the reduced, or at least, okay, I'm here on a weekend, I don't know what it's like Monday through Friday, but the amount of traffic on the street it seems calm and manageable, um, and partly that's due to the fact the streets aren't so wide, they're, they're more of a pedestrian scale. The um, intimacy extends to the architecture, that the buildings are not very large. Um, even if an entire block is surrounded by continuous buildings, you don't get any feeling of oppression, you have a feeling of, oh, I want to know what's around the corner. You know, it actually draws you through. It makes you want to see more, um, as opposed to other places I can think of where it's like, get me out of here, please. Uh, no, it's something that draws you in. It's like a friend, you know, who sort of makes you feel at home. Um, the materials, there's a beautiful, uh, you could very easily make a kind of catalog of things like bay windows and uh, dormers and all the little elements that make the buildings work. And that would be part of that DNA that I was talking about earlier. You could write building with Lake Forest in mind, modeled after the Nantucket example, and it would be a very valuable exercise and it would be a great way to get started with a form-based code. So I hope that answers your question. That's a lovely thought in getting us to a form-based code. That's the, it's a two-step process. You first have to know what you have, and then you have to make decisions about what you want to do next. Thank you. Tom. Can you just talk briefly about the intersection that would happen between a form-based code as a sort of guiding, sort of benevolent governing document, and the kind of reasonable expectations of developers who may see something that's, that they view as a, what we would call an opportunity, and what, how does a form-based code interact with the notion of opportunity seen through the eyes of a developer? Well, one of the things is another step that I didn't uh, specifically address, but there is an intermediate step, which is the charrette process. And one of the things that sh good charrettes do is they get all the stakeholders around the table. So instead of a bunch of architects going off into their drafting room and coming up with this beautiful plan that then everybody shoots down because the plan didn't take into consideration these things, you get all of the people together around the table. So the developer is there, the city is there, the architect is there, the landscape is there, the health people are there. I mean, whoever, the neighbors are there, uh, whoever has an interest in that project participates in trying to figure out how are we going to move forward. So I think the best way to do this is to, in fact, ask people from the beginning, you know, um, well, Mr. Developer, uh, what is it you're looking for? Or Ms. Developer, what is it that you're looking for here? Um, and if he says, you know, a hundred story tower, you know, full of, you know, uh, apartments for um, oligarchs, then you say, well, I don't think you're the right developer for us. But I do believe, I'm, um, being an architect means that I, like Tom, I'm an optimist. Uh, you can't be, you, you can't not be an optimist and be an architect because projects take so long. The only, the only profession that is more optimistic than architecture is landscape architecture <laughs> because your landscape probably won't look like anything for at least 50 years, right? <laughs> the trees grow and then, oh, it's starting to look nice, you know. So you have to be an optimist and one of my optimistic, or if not idealistic ideas is that with goodwill and with a civic sense of belonging and a sense of um, wanting to be at home in the place, that all those stakeholders will in some way find a way to meet the needs of everyone around the table and still protect their town. You know, I think it can be done. I think it, uh, there are plenty of examples of it that I could give you. And uh, some of my colleagues who are more directly involved in that aspect uh, could give you additional examples. So it's, it's a process that has been shown to work all over the country. Um, yes, it, it assumes a certain amount of goodwill, but you know that that's what we need for everything we do, right? So, does that yes. answer the question? How are we doing? Great. Any more questions? <coughs> yes, sir. What are some bad examples in uh, downtown Lake Forest? I promised the people who invited me, the good people here in Lake Forest. Um, and what I do when I go around the country and give these talks is I.
consciously try to avoid local controversies, and I think you'll understand <laughs> why. Goodbye. I'd like to be invited back. <laughs> so uh, I can tell you that Lake Forest is by far one of the least um, troubling places that I have seen. So uh, I really, it's not like I could say, well, the whole west side has to go, you know. I, I wouldn't say that, right? Well, thank you so much. to tout um, Stephen's book, um, The Future of the Past. It's a great book. Um, a lot of the slides he used were from the book. Um, it goes more in depth, so if you're really interested in learning a little bit more about it, um, you can sign up out at the desk, and um, just your name and your phone number, we'll order them, we'll get them in to the um, bookstore, and then you can pick them up and buy them through the bookstore. Um, so it's a really great book, and he's coming out with another book soon. <laughs> Early next year. So we look forward to that. Right. Um, and then he does a great interior um, architecture book. Um, oh, thank so you. anyway, um, we are so happy to have you here, and thank you for um, your expert uh, opinion of Lake Forest and kind of our. We're kind of at a at a pivotal point right now that we're really working on some things, so we really appreciate the information. Great. Well, thank you again, and uh, thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you all.